All right, good morning, everyone. So we're going to bear with me. Um, my voice is a little bit in and out today. I just got it back, so I think that was like, woohoo, we got it back for today. So we're just going to go with it. Some of you may know me. My name is Ali McGitty. I'm an HR consultant here with Marshall McConnell Agency. And I'm really happy that we have Kate here with us today. And we're going to talk about uh, critical, critical disability leave, FMLA, all that fun stuff that you guys just can't wait to get more knowledge on. <laughs> um, I'm going to let Kate just introduce herself, tell you where she works a little bit about her so you can get to know her as well. Hi, everybody. My name is Kate Bischoff. I'm an employment attorney with the law firm Zell LLP. We have about 70 attorneys nationwide, and I get to be one of the lucky employment attorneys there. Um, in addition to suffering from law degree, I am also a fancy pants HR person with all of the right initials after my name because I spent a lot of time overseas being an HR director for the U.S. embassies and consulates overseas. So I have been in the trenches. I know exactly how difficult it is and how absolutely rewarding it can be. But then you get to this stuff and it's just you want to pull your hair out. So I've spent a lot of time learning about it and talking about it. So I hopefully I can give you some insight on these particular tricky issues or what some employment attorneys call the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah, so. absolutely. We've all felt like we've been in the Bermuda Triangle when dealing with it, right? Absolutely. All right, so what we're gonna cover today, we're gonna talk about which laws apply to which employers, right? Because not every law applies to each and every one of you. So it's important to know which ones you have to follow. We're gonna talk about who is eligible for accommodations and leaves. We'll talk about how to respond to manager and employee questions, because that's where it gets tricky, right? And then we'll talk about documentation that's needed. Obviously what we shouldn't do, right? Because it's important to know what we should do, but what shouldn't we do so we can avoid some of those legal pitfalls? And then we'll talk about some of the effects on workers' comp and benefits. So we're going to talk about the big three. This is the Americans with Disabilities Act, the, and it, which includes the amendments of 2008. We, uh, employment attorneys still talk about these amendments because they were groundbreaking. Before you could have um, someone who had the stomach flu well, you would not necessarily need to reasonably accommodate them. Now, the stomach flu, you do have to reasonably accommodate after these amendments. In addition, we're going to talk about the Family Medical Leave Act, a little bit of GINA, the Genetic Information and Non-Discrimination Act, and then we're also going to talk about all the state and local laws that kind of confluence into this here. What, one thing I would like you to leave with today is the understanding that municipalities and counties are really getting into the employment law game. They think it's super duper fun. Minneapolis will pass a Fight for 15 bill this year, probably, and Minneapolis will also require employers to have paid leave. If you have any operations in Minneapolis, this is the time to pay attention to what the council is doing because they're very adamant about implementing these. Other municipalities are big too. We can all point to San Francisco as the place where the birthplace of local laws began, and now it's spreading throughout the country. So we're going to talk a little bit about what those various state and local laws are as well. So are you covered? If you as the employer, do you have an obligation to employees when it comes to leave and a reasonable accommodation issues? In general, the answer is no if you're small. If you have less than 15 employees, you're not going to be required to do anything with them. You can be mean, mean people if you'd like. Not necessarily the policy I'd recommend you go with, but if you have less than 15 employees, there's going to be very little requirements on you from this perspective. Minnesota has a one plus, which means you should try to accommodate in the best ways you can under the Minnesota Human Rights Act, but you're going to have an easier way of establishing an undue burden if you have very few employees. The ADA starts at 15 or more employees. The Family Medical Leave Act starts at 50 within the same distance. So if you have multiple locations, let's say you got somebody in Bermidji, you got somebody, another facility down in Rochester, they're going to be too far apart to aggregate that group of employees. You don't have to count them all together. But start with the baseline of, do I have 50 employees? OK, maybe I need to think hard about whether or not the FMLA is going to apply. And then GINA is the same as the ADA, 15 or more employees. The ADA, the ADA is, um, in addition to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission implementing and enforcing the ADA, there are lots of other commissions who get involved in this. The Department of Labor is a big one. The Department of Transportation, if you have any kind of trucking component to your work, as well as the Federal Communication 
commission if you have if you're building cell towers or you're doing anything with cellular service and then the Department of Justice if you are a state and local government um, the Department of Justice gets really heavily involved in this and takes most of their cues from the EEOC if it's a public employer they they are not gun shy they like to get in in the business of this and it it the ADA applies to any qualified individual. Anybody who on paper looks like they can do the job with or without a reasonable accommodation is going to have the protection of the ADA. Okay. So the Americans with Disabilities Act, established in 1990 under the first uh, Bush, and it defines a di disability very broadly. It says anything that, that substantially interferes with a major life activity. Okay? A major life activity is anything that you do on a daily basis. Okay? If you're walking, you're breathing, you're thinking, <coughs> you're driving, you're lifting, you're twisting, you're turning, all of those kinds of things can be major life activities. If you don't know if it's a major life activity and somebody asks you about it, think about it. Think about, do I, would I do this on a regular basis? Do I climb upstairs? Do I climb ladders? Do I have to twist and turn? Those are the kinds of things you need to think about when, you, when we start talking about major life activities. It also includes people who may have a record of this. And a record of, you know, if I, let's say, I have broken my leg nine million times. I'm a complete klutz, totally within my skill set to break my leg multiple times. But if I'm clumsy and I have repeatedly broken bones, I may now have a record of a disability. And so you can't say, oh, God, I just... She's just a walking work comp problem, and I just shouldn't keep her on anymore. That could be a disability discrimination claim because of the record of disability for it. And the last one is a perceived disability. And a perceived disability is you have a stereotype that would apply to this individual. Okay? Normally, we see perceived disabilities as someone who's had one or more heart attacks. We think, oh my god, we shouldn't keep this person on because they've had multiple heart attacks. They're going to have an impact on our health insurance. We really should find a way to get rid of them. That's discriminatory. It also has another claim to it in TASH, but that is that perception of disability. And the disabilities can include anything that we talk about and anything we see and anything we might not see. We might not see someone who's suffering from anxiety or depression or bipolar. And so when an employee comes to you and you think, oh, they're perfectly healthy, there's no way they're disabled, you may have other things that are going on that you just can't see and that you can't hear, and that's why they're called these silent disabilities. So, and what counts, constitutes a major life activity may differ a little bit by jurisdiction because Minnesota has a much broader definition of disability. We include anything that materially affects a major life activity, which is a lower threshold. So we protect employees to a higher degree in Minnesota. So you see some variations between state and local governments. Good. So what are the definitions, right? Because we all hear, we have to, maybe you have to reasonably accommodate. Well, what does that really mean to us? It's a modification or an adjustment to the work or the working environment that allows the disabled individual to perform the essential functions of the position. So that's still very broad, right? We don't really have a definite answer. So we're going to do some case cases and we're going to talk through some examples that will help kind of identify that. But the most important thing that I want you guys to realize on the site, they still have to be qualified, right? So it has to meet those skills, knowledge, ability, education, all those requirements as long as they're justified, right? So we can't just arbitrarily throw up, well, you need your master's degree for an entry level position, right? So we want to make sure that we're really paying attention to the qualified individual. So I know a lot of people are in this process and they're like, oh gosh, well an applicant disclosed to us that they have a disability, now we have to hire them. That's not true, right? You still have to have the qualified individual piece to it. So what is reasonable? An effective accommodation enables the disability to perform the job or the position. And it's not every accommodation, and it's not the best accommodation. So a lot of times as employers, we get an employee comes to our office and asks us, hey, I need this accommodation, or this is what's going on, I need a sit stand station. And we're like, oh my gosh, we're so fearful that we're not going to be compliant with the law that we're just like, yep, what do you need? Right? And it's not every accommodation. So Kate's going to talk through what that looks like. Um, but just keep in mind that you don't always have to go forward with exactly what that employee is saying that they want as that accommodation. It could be things like time off. right? So, hey, I need some time off to take care of some things, go to doctor's appointments. It could be changes in equipment, headphones. right? 
So maybe I can't hear as well, I need a new headphone, or I need headsets, or I need, I have hearing loss, so I need safety protection when I go out to a client site. Or I have a wheelchair and it doesn't fit underneath my desk. Can we lift the desk? And then it could be additional training or modified training as well. So maybe I can't learn in a group setting, maybe need that one-on-one -on -one setting. So undue burden, this is one of my favorite topics because employers always think it applies to them, okay? If an employee comes to you and says, I'm having trouble using my arms and legs, I need an exoskeleton to allow me to move so that I look like I'm RoboCop, okay? Those things right now cost a half a million dollars. That's an undue burden on almost every employer, okay? Maybe not Apple, they're making pretty good money, but at almost every employer, that's gonna be an undue burden for them, okay? If they come to you and say, I need a sit-stand station because my back has really been bothering me, you know, what can I do? We need to look at a bunch of different factors. We need to look at what is the nature and the cost of the accommodation? What are the financial resources of the, resources of the organization? The number of employees, the effect of the accommodation would have on the resources on the employees, and the impact the accommodation would have on the employer. Note, if you don't like it, that's not an undue burden, okay? So if you have, let's say you have an open floor plan and everybody moves their desks every day. It just, you come in and you find the spot that you want to sit, you hot desk, okay? If you're going to put in a sit stand station for one person, does that mean that you eliminate your hot desking protocol? No. You're going to have one sit stand station that's going to be devoted to that employee. Does, is every other employee going to think that they're getting more special treatment? Probably. But... That, does, that isn't something that you can consider in whether there's an undue burden. You need to look at the employee, say, do you have a disability? Yes, we've got back problems. We need to reasonably accommodate you because we have enough employees under the ADA to, or the Minnesota Human Rights Act to cover this, so yes. Um, one thing that your doctor says that can help this is if we put a sit-stand station in, okay, how much would that cost? Well, my brother-in-law can make one, so that would probably be 100 bucks. Okay, so yes, we can do it. But you need to go through the, that analysis to determine whether or not something's an undue burden. It is really difficult to establish an undue burden unless it's that exoskeleton kind of scenario where it's going to be super expensive. Today, assistive technology is really, really cool, and assistive technology is really, really inexpensive, and there are ways that you can do these things cheaply. For example, I have one client who has a blind employee and who spends a lot of time on a computer. Okay, if you're going to be surfing the net, it's hard to do that when you're blind. But with between his organization that he's a part of and the employer, they were able to split the cost of having some assistive technology to help him read and see the um, internet. So it was pretty cost effective for them to do that. Okay. Okay. I think the biggest thing that we see is it's not going to be necessarily you, but it might be your managers that you have to kind of put up this battle and stay strong with because, oh, well, that person's not a good performer or, you know, we get into these issues and they're like, no, that's, we're not going to do it. We're not going to accommodate it. We possibly can't do it. And it's hard because they're thinking about their operations, right? It, it hurts productivity. It might hurt their budget, whatever it is, but it's important that we stay strong and go back to these factors. So you might want to print these off and put these by your desk. Because these are really what it's going to make a determination if it's undue burden or not. So reasonable accommodation requests. These do not need to be in writing. Okay, You may have a policy in your handbook right now that says any request for reasonable accommodation must be in writing. Sure, a judge isn't going to buy it. Okay, If an employee comes to you and says, I need XYZ because I'm suffering from XYZ, you can say, okay, that's in... Thank you for sharing with that information with me. But I need to get a little bit more information from you. And I need your doctor. Here's your job description. I want you to go back to your doctor and talk about what we can and cannot do and what we, what we should do, OK? That's the request in writing. That initial conversation of, I'm going to need a couple things to be changed, or I'm going to need maybe my shift needs to change a little bit. That's an oral request that is going to be sufficient under the law to trigger the interactive process, which we'll get to. 
and just one comment about that. So you notice Kate said you can get a doctor certification. You can under ADA, right? So a lot of people only think we can go get doctor's information under FMLA. If it's an ADA case, you can get that doctor's notification of what a reasonable accommodation would be. Okay? You just need enough information to suspect that the employee might need a reasonable accommodation. And here's some great examples. I need to keep my leg elevated. Okay? Training your managers to hear that statement and go, oh, I need to talk to HR because why? Why was that again? It's because they, you're now hearing a request for a reasonable accommodation. Mm -hmm. So, did you want to go to this one? Yeah. So, a scenario for you an employee appears to be under the influence of his painkillers and we think it's affecting his employment. What can we do, Kate? Well, what do you guys think? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm going to look at this and go, what's happening? I don't care whether or not he's actually under the influence. I care with what's happening in the workplace. If they're slurring their speech and they're becoming incomprehensible, that's a problem. If they're knocking things over, that's a problem. I cannot, as an employer, look at them and say, you must be under the influence. I need to check behavior and behavior only. If they smell like booze, you, your hygiene is a problem. Okay? If they are slurring their speech, they're not walking in a straight line, if they're you know, acting more gregarious or inappropriate than usual, I discipline the behavior and deal with the behavior only. Okay? I cannot make the assumption that they're under the influence because Chemical dependency that is current, that's happening right now, is not a dis dis disability, and I can only discipline the behavior. If I, if I start prescribing what I think is going on with the employee, I'm going to get into this perceived disability problem really quickly. And that can be a, a big deal. If someone is manic one day and really depressed the other day, I can go, my common sense suggests maybe this is bipolar, but I can't diagnose an employee, and that's where we get into trouble. We as humans go, oh, there's something wrong here, and that's totally normal, but as an employer, we have to step back and go, the behavior is the problem here. Mm -hmm. So if chemical dependency is not covered if it's current, if it's a history of chemical <coughs> dependency, it is covered under the ADA. So if I have someone who's, who's been sober for five years, I cannot terminate them because I think they might go get drunk. Okay. How many of you guys have drug testing policies, drug and alcohol testing policies? So this is where it gets a little tricky with that too, right? So we're disciplining the performance because we don't know. But then there's a time maybe where you have to say, you know what, we need to do reasonable suspicion if you have that policy. Again, under Minnesota state law, it's really important that you feel very confident in those policies because Minnesota is very strict on their drug testing laws. Anything you want to add on that one? Yes. If you're testing for alcohol, please reconsider. And the reason I say this is Minnesota has a, a um, secondary test that if you have a positive test for alcohol the first round and then the employee goes, well, I would like you to retest, alcohol disappears no matter what kind of container you keep it in. And so the retest could cause you to have problems. So I, unless you're required under DOT or some other laws to test for alcohol, I'd really like you to consider reconsider, reconsidering that piece of it. Test for drugs all you want. I don't care. It's the alcohol that can be the problem here. When, when you're directing care and treatment, that's when we get into trouble. And when you think an employee is a direct threat to him, him or herself or others, please deal with it as they are a problem in the workplace from be, a behavior standpoint. The direct threat um, safe harbor under the ADA is really a very narrow exception and you can't use it unless you have some real serious beliefs that they are a direct threat. Smelling like alcohol is not going to be one of the ways that they are going to be a direct threat. So saying, well, you're a direct threat to yourselves and others, that, that is the issue, that's how we're going to get around the ADA, that might not be the best way. Discipline the behavior, handle the behavior, not the underlying condition. Right, it's really easy, right, everyone? <laughs> Saw some of your faces, you're like, no, come on. <laughs> so a little scenario for you. Max complains of back pain and he approaches his manager about the possibility of a standing desk because he thinks that if he stands more, he'll feel better. So what do we do in this situation? What do you guys think? 
Do we just give him a sit stand? No. So even earlier, Kate had mentioned, you know, my brother-in-law can make one for 100 bucks, right? So the employee might come to you and be like, this is a sit stand I want. I saw it on a commercial. It's printed off. Here's the one I want. This is going to be really helpful for me. We don't always have to do that, right? We can say, can there be another accommodation? Can we lift the desk? What does that look like? And we can seek medical proof that they need this, right? Is that really the accommodation that the doctor recommends? Um, and another thing about this that I want you guys to know is that managers, bless their heart, a lot of times really care about the employees. And they're like, yes, I'll do that for you. How much does it cost? Okay, 500 bucks. We got this. We'll take care of it for you. But then that starts a trend, right? We didn't get certification. We just allowed it for this employee. So are we doing that for all of our employees going forward? What does that look like? So it's really important, again, to train your managers on how to identify those. I, I'm really trying to sell my firm on the treadmill desk. I think it <coughs> really help me in the long run <laughs> and reduce my risk of diabetes. Um, but they're not buying it quite yet. Just got to get a doctor's certificate. Yeah. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about FMLA. Does anybody have any questions about ADA before we just jump into FMLA? And the, Yeah. What do okay. you do? Do you want to repeat the question? Sure. So the question is, what if you have an employee who shares with another employee that they're having suicidal thoughts? This is what I would do. One, I would act like a human and say, hey, how are things going? Is there anything you need? Um, how's work going? How are you able to do everything? Is, are you having a good time? Is there anything I can do? And just do a check-in from that perspective. My hope is that, I know I live in a little dream world, that Every human resources person knows everybody on the floor at all the time and is able to go have that kind of conversation. But I would start with that conversation. If you have an EAP or anything like that, maybe you want to bring the information along with you. Mm -hmm. But you have to stop short of, do you need to see a doctor? You need to stop short of, you know, have you tried Xanax? You know, um, so you need to stop there. But I would check in and see with them first. But how are, how are things going? Then I would check and see with the manager. How are things going? Is there anything that you need? Without mentioning the suicidal right. thoughts to the manager, okay? But I would do that, I would take the pulse there, okay? Um, it's really hard to stop at the, do you think you need to see somebody question, but that's where you do need to stop because you don't want to put them in a position where you are prescribing some kind of particular treatment. Uh, only if I knew for sure that something was going to happen. Um, if, if there were more concrete plans, maybe. But suicidal thoughts, I mean, I walk to the edge of a cliff and go, what would happen if I just went, woo, okay? So, but there's, there's that difference. Yeah. So the question was, in case you didn't hear, should we report that to the authorities? So, great question. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing, too, is, you know, these laws and the cases that come out, we're scared to take action, right? We're almost scared to talk to the employees. And what we want to encourage you to do is don't be scared. Have a conversation, right? They're employees. You can treat them as human beings at the end of the day and have that conversation. Just be careful of what you say. And we don't want to advise care, and we'll talk about that. Yeah. On the back um, scenario that you gave, yeah. so it's okay if somebody came in and said, I have back pain, I want to see my desk, but that you could request a doctor's certification before you do anything? Yes. You I could, would. You could say, you know, can you go get a note from your doctor? I wouldn't use doctor certification, right? right? But uh, um, I would say, can you get a note from your doctor or your chiropractor or whoever has been treating you to suggest that this is something that you need? And more often than not, the employees can go, okay, that's easy. Because more often than not, a doctor's going to write you any note you want, right? At least mine will. Um, if you want his name, I'll give him to you. Um, <coughs> yeah, you can certainly ask for that in advance and say, you know what, before we do this, we, can you just go get a doctor's note from us? And I've had it happen where people are like, meh, not really worth it because I didn't go to my doctor to get that. It was just, I thought it would be nice to get a sit stand, right? So definitely take advantage of that if you can because then you're not starting that precedent that we're just going to give it to everybody, but you have to have that doctor's note us. And that, that's the other part of managers is to make sure that managers go, okay, you need to talk to HR. Right. Because managers are generous people at heart, right? They all are. 
So everybody's favorite law, the FMLA. We should have like a dun dun dun. <laughs> okay, so the U.S. Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division oversees the Family Medical Leave Act. Um, just this week, I'll show you the color version because it's prettier. They published a new employer guide. It is 75 pages of really good information about the FMLA. Um, I, I, I'm going to now show you my copy. I went through and highlighted it because there were some very interesting things in here to me that um, the, the Wage and Hour Division is taking different stances than what courts would say. One of them in here is that you can require employees to request leave in the normal course of how they request leave. A court is going to say, no, do you have enough information that they need to leave? not that they followed the actual leave request form. So there were some interesting differences in here than what the current state of the law is, but I highly recommend it, particularly on page eight of the guide. So if you want a, the link to it, we can send that to you. Yeah, we can send that link out. Otherwise, if you just Google employer's guide, it pops right up. Yeah. So state laws may apply. Many, many states, including the great state of Minnesota, has various um, Family Medical Leave Act requirements. Minnesota has the parental leave, so if you're not, if you have smaller than 50 employees, you may be required to provide parental leave. Um, and also, employees are able to use their sick or PTO time to care for a immediate family member. But then we're seeing lots of local laws too. The state of New York just passed a, um, a paid leave law. The city of New York City has one, San Francisco has one, and as I mentioned earlier, the city of Minneapolis is contemplating paid leave at this point in time. So if you're based in Minnesota and you have a lot of other remote offices, it's really important that you're paying attention. What's going on in the cities and the states that we have? Okay, so covered employees. If you're in the private sector and you have 50 or more employees in 20 or more work weeks and in the current or preceding calendar year, okay? So I'm imagining a Christmas tree farm. They have a lot of employees in the summer, watering trees and trimming trees. They have a lot of employees in November and December cutting trees, okay? They don't have anybody around in, you know, January, February, March is my guess, okay? I don't know anything about the Christmas tree industry. <laughs> I'm pulling this all out of my boom, okay? So, but over that 20-week period, they may have 50 employees. That's going to be enough to trigger the Family Medical Leave Act. If they have 50 or more, or it doesn't matter if they're part-time. It doesn't matter if they're full-time. If they have 50 or more people on the payroll, they're going to be required under the FMLA to provide leave. If you're a public agency, if you're a school district, I think I saw a couple school district names on there um, today. If you're a school district, you are automatically required. Even if you only have 19 students and three teachers, okay, you're going to be required to provide FMLA. Um, and a covered employee is any employee who's worked for you for 12 months, at least 12 months, and this is going to go in any 12-month calendar, okay? So if they started in March, by the next March, they're going to be able to be eligible for leave. Who's worked 12, 50 hours? This includes overtime. So if they are very part-time, but they work a couple overtime, if they're on the tree farm and they're cutting trees in, the, in December and they worked up to 12, 50, they're going to be eligible for leave. And it works at a location that has the 50 or more employees within 75 miles, okay? So if I have someone who works, I have a facility in Stillwater, I have a facility in Hudson, they each have 25 employees, I'm, for both centers, I'm going to be required to give them leave because it doesn't matter if they're in the other state, they're still within 50 miles of each other or 75 miles of each other. Kate, okay, what if I have an employee who works from home? Where does that employee report to? Who, where is their manager? where um, that is going to be the considered their location for work. It's a big one that we see. So FMLA provides 12 weeks of unpaid leave to be taken for the serious illness of an employee, the care of immediate family member with a serious health condition and includes safe same-sex spouses, uh, the placement of a child in foster care or with adoption and the birth of a child, the qualifying ex exigency related to the immediate family member being on military or covered active duty, which is, can be a little confusing, and so luckily Allie's going to cover that one, um, and then cared for a covered service member for up to 26 weeks. 
So the son or daughter, 18 years or younger, or someone who has the inability for self-care. So just because they're over the age of 18, but if they have a disability or a condition that makes it so that they are not able to give self-care, then that would consider them a child underneath the serious health condition for FMLA. In local parentis, you don't have to be legally related or biologically related to qualify under this. We do have a case study we'll show you later, but it's whoever has the day-to-day -day responsibilities for caring for that individual. So say I was raised by my grandma. She could qualify if we were, you know, the same household and she took care of me um, and I had to care for her. So it doesn't need to say, well, you're not legally married or you're not legally, um, I'm sorry, you're not legally a child. It could be, you know, a guardian. So serious health condition, a lot of times this is a, a tricky one, right? It's how long do they have to be out before we consider FMLA? And this is where we really have to train our managers to let us know. Oftentimes we get into situations where someone's like, oh yeah, that person's been out for a week, they've been sick. And HR is like, what? Why didn't you tell us? And they're like, oh, we didn't know when they'd come back. We didn't really think about it, right? And that totally happens all the time. And it kills us a little bit as HR, but it, we need to help the managers know when to bring it forward. And it's, not, it's nothing against them. It's just it doesn't trigger something in their mind, so we have to educate them. And so really it's a period of incapacity or treatment connected with inpatient care, requiring an absence for more than three calendar days. That involves continuing care. So a lot of times if we have someone, we find out that one of our employees is in the hospital, that's a good trigger for us. Uh, due to pregnancy, that's an easy one, right? We all know if someone says they're pregnant, that's really when we want to start that FMLA process. Don't ask a chubby girl if she's pregnant. Yeah, don't ask. Let them tell you, right? It's safer that way. I think we've all learned the hard way. Um, a period of incapacity due to chronic serious conditions such as asthma, diabetes, or epilepsy. And then multiple treatments. Absence is due to multiple treatments. We do have another seat up here if you want to come up. I'm sorry. I know it's the front. Um, absence is due to multiple treatments as well. Qualifying exigencies. Is the situation arising from the military deployment of an employee, spouse, son, daughter, or parent in a foreign country? So this is one situation where you the employee does not necessarily need to be directly related to the person who needs the care. Okay? So let's say Allie and I are getting married. Allie's mother. No one said congratulations. <laughs> We're going to be a very happy couple for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Allie's mother has Alzheimer's and Allie is an active service member. She is going to go overseas and her mother is going to need lots and lots of treatment. I am going to be obligated given our relationship to take care of her mother and you are going to be obligated to give me time off to do that as the employer. This is those qualifying exigencies that that arise, okay? And I don't need to be directly related to Allie's mom for that to happen. I can just have a strong relationship with her that might not be legal or not. So it's making those alternative child care arrangements, attending deployment ceremonies or welcome home ceremonies, spending time with Allie while she's back for rest. Hopefully she gets sent to Hawaii for rest and recuperation, and so I get to take leave to go do that. Um, and then making financial and legal relation, uh, arrangements as well. So what I really want to point out here is you guys are going to get a lot of different situations, and you're going to want to say automatically, yep, qualified under FMLA, not qualified under FMLA not that easy, right? So feel, feel rest assured that it's okay to say, let me think about this and go look up. There's tons of different fact sheets um, from the DOL that really outlines each thing. They actually do a pretty good job outlining what do we do under the situation. So make sure if something comes up that you are investigating because some of these things you're not going to encounter every day, but it's important to know that, hey, something might qualify under that. Just another thing, I don't charge for a phone call. So if you have a quickie, give me a call. Call her all the time. She, she regrets offering up her number. <laughs> um, so covered service member, any eligible employee may take up to 26 work weeks during a single 12-month period to care for a service member that has a serious injury um, or illness when they are immediate relative or next of kin of the service member. So this has to be an immediate family member versus what Kate was just talking about. And this is a different 12-month period for the military leave. Um, it's different than that 12-month period that we talk about for, you know, like the birth of a baby or your own serious illness. So I want to spend a little bit time, uh, a little bit of time on this picture because I think this is a great. I'm a visual learner. Every time I have FMLA, I actually print off a checklist and say I'm walking through it, right? Because you know, if it's really a 12-week period, I can't even remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. Let alone when did this employee turn out the paperwork? Where are we at in the process? 
So if you want, you can print this off and have a little checklist for each and every one of your employees and put dates on it. That's just fine. Um, but the first thing that we need to do as an employer is we need to have a policy. Does everybody have a policy in their handbook? Okay. If you don't have a policy in your handbook, you want to make sure you want to have one, but also you want to give them to new hires as they come on board. So if you're not giving your handbook to new hires, make sure that you're at least giving them a policy and notice about their rights under FMLA. And this other thing here is this, this new form that we got. So this is updated. So everybody's going to go back to the office today and swap out their old poster for this new employee rights poster. Um, again, accessible via uh, Google. We can also send out a link to that as well. But do make sure that if you have a current FMLA poster because you're covered under FMLA that you do update that because um, there's a steep fine of $110. So. Right, that was it's colorful, it's new, it's it updated, is. It actually and is it's a lot required. better than the old one. It is. Yeah. It's really easy, it really outlines the rights, so it's great. So the first thing is we have to allow employees to have that notice. The second thing is the employee gives us notice that they need leave, right? So foreseeable, a lot of times they come down, they might say, gosh, you know, we're having a baby, or this is what the situation is. Other times, again, they might tell their manager, and our managers have to let us know to start the paperwork. The other thing that I want to mention here is that I want HR or one person doing the FMLA paperwork. I don't want managers doing their own paperwork, okay? Um, some organizations do that just because the managers have direct um, control, and then also, you know, HR is up at headquarters or major managers are with them, but make sure that you have one person doing that or a couple people doing it, but it's not the manager filling out the paperwork. The FMLA is hyper-technical. So if you miss but something by a day, if, and it's really easier for a manager to miss something by a day, you can screw the pooch. Um, so it's really important that you have someone who's very well versed in how this goes and has the checklist or has the DOL new employer guide handy so that they can follow this. So that's why Allie mentions that having one contact person because it's really important. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think a lot of times people are like, oh, it's not that big of a deal, it's just pushing paper back and forth, right? But it really is important that you're meeting those deadlines. And managers shouldn't have access to certain care or chronic conditions. So it's really important that you try to have it, uh, someone outside of there. So step two, they let us know, hey, I'm going to need some leave, okay? Well, they try to let us know within 30 days if they can, if it's foreseeable, right? So having a baby, hopefully you know 30 days before you have that baby that you're going to have a baby, right? You let us know. Something, tragic if you didn't. Right, so that's a life change if you didn't. Um, but they have a whole TV show about it. You guys have all seen that, right? I didn't know I was expecting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you haven't seen the show? No. Oh, it's a show. Okay. Um, and <laughs> we got to get you out more. We got to get me out more. Um, so the employee should let us know within 30 days. Obviously, if they're in the hospital, they're not going to let you know, hey, gosh, I have a serious condition, because they didn't know 30 days in advance that they were going to be there. So, right, the 30 days is a guideline, but not necessarily always. I'm to planning do it. a horrible car accident. Right. For you can do that. So, but the law is in there to protect us if it is foreseeable. Then what happens is the employer, we go to step three. We have to give them their eligibility and rights and responsibility notice within five days. So, you'll notice here on the screen the red notice. That's why it's important that managers are aware to let HR know timely. It's not, I'm going to let you know in a few days when I have time or when I can get around to calling you, but it's, hey, we got to do it within five days. And if HR is going to be out of the office, do we have a backup plan? Do we have someone else on our team who knows how to fill out the paperwork? What does that look like? So then what happens is we give them the medical certification and we have to allow the employee at least 15 days to return that form. So we have to give them at least 15 days to fill out that certification. We can't say, yep, give that back to us tomorrow, which is really hard, especially if they're going back, you know, if their leave is immediate, right? But we have to allow them at least 15 days, and it will say that on the form as well. And then the employee turns back the form, and then what we need to do is we need to give them their designation notice. Again, we have a whopping five days to do that. So we have a lot of time, right? They get 15 days to do it, but we get five. So it's really important that you know what those time frames are because you want to stay true to those. A lot of times you can set a private reminder in your calendar to make sure that you send those out. Um, the other thing that I want to say is if you are sending it to an employee and you're sending it to their work email address and they don't have access to their email address, is that going to count as giving them notice? No, right? Sometimes we certify mail it to their house. Sometimes we can email it to their personal email address or fax it. So that's important too. Not, hey, well, we emailed it to your work address. Well, I don't have access to my computer or my email when I'm not at work. So we send them that designation notice. Then what happens is eventually the employee comes back to work, hopefully, 
Um, and we may ask for fitness for duty tests and Kate will talk about doing that later, but then also we might put them back into the same or similar position or ADA may come into play. So that's why we talked about ADA at first because a lot of times they might come back, but just because they come back after that 12 weeks doesn't mean everything's good to go. A lot of times with a serious health care condition, they might need ongoing care and it might be an ADA issue. So the first thing that we do, right, this is a picture of that new form, see pretty, all the colors, it used to just be uh, blue and red. So you're going to want to post this, and there, you know, there's that whopping $110 fine if we fail to post it. Notice how this is workers <laughs> and applicants. Yep. I think that one of the things that we find is that employers fail to understand that even FMLA needs to be available and known to applicants that they are covered. So this may mean something that you post on your career site that we offer FMLA, or it may be something that you have when you're interviewing folks that they come in that they are able to see the poster when you give them maybe a tour of the facility. Mm -hmm. so. Or put it in that new hire packet, you know, that welcome, or your, um, here's our benefit guide. Here's an FMLA form, right? All that stuff, as long as you're giving that to them and so they can see it in some way. So you all must display that poster and covered employers have to provide a general notice. So we talked about that policy as well. So if you don't have a policy, please put that on your to-do list for today. Okay, so the employee comes to manager and says, I need blah. And I put this bullet point up here of the manager freaks out because that's usually what happens. The manager freaks out, right? The manager goes, ah, okay. And then comes and sees HR. The HR talks to the employee as, as the law requires. And they identify the need, whether it be an accommodation, leave, or something else. And then there's this conversation back and forth. This is what's known as the interactive process. So even under the FMLA, there is this time where we have the conversation. We have specific forms that we need to be filled out that are intended to foster this discussion. Okay? We see, we just decide what laws we think are, are applicable here. And then we address the information that we may need to get. We may need to get that medical certification from the employee. And what I want you to know is that this is not a one-time event. If you have an employee who's going to go have a baby, you're going to have this conversation about when do you plan to start taking your leave? What happens if you need to take your leave early? What happens if um, something doesn't go right? What are, what are we planning for? Okay? That conversation doesn't just happen the first time the employee comes into your office and says, I'm having a baby, right? This conversation is probably going to be ongoing for a period of time. The same is true for any serious medical condition or any care that they may be giving to uh, an immediate family member. If I am going to be helping care for Allie's mother who has Alzheimer's, I'm not going to just say, I need 12 weeks and I'm done, because she's not going to be cured in 12 weeks. This is going to be an ongoing issue that I may need to need more time or may need some intermittent leave or that I'm going to need some flexibility. These are not one-time conversations. And if you're hoping that that's going to be the case, I'm really sorry. That's probably going to put you in a spot where you're going to need to talk to me and nobody ever need, wants to need to talk to me. Okay? Okay. So it's that interactive process, right? We have to have a conversation with the employee. And, you know, I think that's the biggest thing, too, is I don't think we can stress it enough. Don't have the manager get all the dirty details. Have HR or someone in the, you know, a senior leadership, whoever holds the FMLA power does that. So an FMLA, the leave request for an employee, uh, generally we can say, you know, people say, gosh, I'm having a baby or I'm in the hospital, you know, things like that we talked about. Encourage managers to go to HR. Um, and again, we talked about that 30 days notice as soon as practical. The rights and responsibilities forms. Okay, so the Department of Labor does something that's really kind of cool. They've already done the forms for you. Please use their forms. Please don't create your own forms because you might miss something. And I don't want you to miss something because then again, you have to talk to someone like me. Okay? These forms are really great. They cover nearly everything. If you have some additional benefits, that you give an addition that is not covered on the forms, you can just have a cover sheet, but use these forms. They're readily available, dol.gov forward slash whd forward slash fmla, and they all pop right up in front of you. And I actually recommend that you have a separate form, right? Use these because these are great, this is FMLA. But then we also want to let employees know what's going to happen to your benefits. How does short-term disability work? How do I pay for you know my health care, my dental, all of that stuff? What do I expect when I come back? Do I have to let my employer know? 
that's really a great opportunity to share that information with employees. I think that leave process, when they come back, how we handle that is really going to determine their commitment to our organization, right? So if they had a terrible process, we didn't support them through that. They just had a baby. It's their first time. They come back. They don't know where our mother's room is. They don't really know what to expect, how their benefits are, how to add their son or daughter to the plan. That's really going to show a lot about how we care about our employees. So it's really important that we do provide them some notices and maybe we have what to expect when you're on leave, a little document, you know, what is short-term disability? Am I eligible? How much is that? How do I apply? Benefits. How do my benefits continue? And say, hey, welcome back from work. We're so glad you had a baby. Welcome to the family. Here's what you can expect. Here's the mother room. Here's, here's our policy around that. Does anybody have anything like that? Yeah. Do employees like it? Yeah. It makes that scary, ambiguous process. Like, we think FMLA is scary. Employees are like, I don't want that. I don't know what that is, right? So the more we can do to help them, the better. So the certification form. Again, there's quite a few different certification forms for different illnesses. So a certification of healthcare provider for an employee serious injury or for a family members, for different military leaves and so on. Make sure you're using these two and make sure you're not using the same one for everything. Um, the important thing is do they update these? They just updated these not too long ago, a couple yep. months ago. So make sure if you do save these to your drive, like your, your internal drive, that you're pulling the new forms because they did just update those. Yeah. You're going to give them the designation of notice that says you do not qualify for FMLA. Good question. You do want to give them that, though, at least. <clears throat> so obtaining that certification, and we talked about that a lot, they have at least 15 days, and they might say, well, gosh, well, I'm not going to go to the doctor and pay for that. But they do have an obligation to go to the doctor and have some sort of notice and pay for that. So you don't have to pay for that visit to get that. Um, but if they've already had ongoing care, and they've seen their doctor, they can just fax that sheet in. They don't need to go see the doctor for a new appointment. Does that make sense? So you don't need to pay for that initial um, thing. Because you might say, well, gosh, I have this really illness I need to take off work. And they might say, well, I'm not going to the doctor because I don't want to pay for that. And the employee does have that obligation. And now with more electronic medical records, I can just send an email to Dr. Ramsey and say, yo, Ramsey, can you fill out this form for me via email? So that it makes it a lot easier and not incurring that additional expense. Right. So that employee doesn't have to go seek a new appointment. They just have to have that doctor fill out that certification form. Yeah. What happens or what rights do you have as an employer if an employee does not comply with terms? Perfect. We'll talk about that. If I don't address your specific question, though, let me know, okay? So we can at our own expense have a second certification. So if we're seeing the first one and we're like, meh, I don't really know, right? Because Kate's doctor just approves everything. So can we... <laughs> Can we see a second certification? Yes, we can, but that is at our own expense as an employer. Kate, how often do you see people actually do that? Very rarely, because it already raises the, the, the flag of, why is my employer asking me to see another doctor? Right. And that makes me feel uncomfortable. The other part is you can't send them, let's say, let's say I'm a trucking company. I can't send them to my regular DOT doctor. I need to select a doctor that I don't have an ongoing relationship with. So I go into the magic yellow pages of the doctors and I pull somebody out. So now I don't have the, as the employer, I don't have the relationship with the doctor and I'm asking my employee to see somebody that they don't know too. Um, I really recommend empl employers think long and hard about sending them to another certification. Mm -hmm. If it's coming to the point where we think there might be some kind of abuse of leave, then sure. But mm -hmm. before that, probably not. Right. Yeah, and so... Luckily for us, too, different health care providers, all of these lists, it doesn't really matter what your personal opinion is if you don't think, you know, that a midwife should qualify or a chiropractor. I get a lot of people who are like, well, chiropractor, that's not even anywhere related to what this employee's um, injury or illness is that does qualify as a doctor underneath FMLA. I've had an a employer who got a note from a licensed social worker, and I went, huh? How can this possibly be covered for FMLA? And in Minnesota, they're licensed to practice medicine, not as doctors, but they're licensed to provide medical care. And so, yes, licensed social worker will be sufficient here. It's how some eyes roll. I know, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, especially because I get that, that question a lot, and that's why we want to point it out. Again, we have to take out our personal feelings sometimes in this. Um, but, so we'll talk through, you cannot request additional medical information from the healthcare provider, but you can require that they complete the whole form. And so we do have a slide in here, but 
for that form, you can require that you have all the information to make a decision. What happens is you can give it to the employee back and say, gosh, now you have seven days to complete it. So that 15 day groups goes down to seven days for them to complete it. Um, but if we have them go through the first thing and then we have them go through the second certification and we're still not, they didn't agree, we can send them to a third uh, physician that we're both agreeing upon. And then that's, that's the final decision that we have to go with. Yeah. Yes, if there's anything that's vague, ambiguous on the form, you get to ask more questions about it. What you don't get to ask is, well, how long do you think this person's going to be suffering from this disease? You need, can ask, well, how long do you think they need to be out on leave? Not, she's got MS. When do you think she's going to be in a wheelchair? That's the question that right. you can't ask. And that's why, try not to let a manager do this. Yep, good question. Yeah, so you, you can definitely ask for clarification because you have the right to have a full, complete form. So after the receipt of the certification, oh, got some oh. questions over there. Sorry. Go ahead. So let's, so let, let me say cancer, okay? I'm just going to use cancer. It's, everybody hates it. The, the doctor says, thinks that this, this person is going to need to be out for 20 weeks of treatment. That that's what the form says. So you get the FMLA form back and you say, okay, this says 20 weeks. So you call the doctor and say, can you give me a little bit more information about what do you mean by 20 weeks? And this is where you have to go, okay, we're going to have FMLA for 12 weeks. Is it going to be in a reasonable accommodation for us to extend that for an additional eight weeks? And you want to talk to the doctor and say, what makes you say this is going to be 20 weeks versus 24 versus 52. So you want to ask what they think. And maybe the, regi the treatment regimen is 20 weeks, okay? And so that's what they think that's, going to, that's what that means. Um, but you get to ask that question. But you have to keep in your mind that the FMLA says 12. ADA is going to make me be reasonable. Is it going to be reasonable for me to add the additional eight? If it's not going to be reasonable, okay, you still have to allow that 12 weeks of FMLA and then say to the employee, you've exhausted your FMLA. We need to have another conversation about how things are going so we can get you back to work. And if there still needs to be that additional eight weeks or that has extended itself beyond the eight weeks, then you, need, you want to have more information from the doctor and, ask, and asking the employee to allow that conversation to occur. Does that help? Absolutely. Please say if, if this is if this is something a little different, I just need the certification. So you can have your doctor either send me another note or update the certification to include that. And that's totally fine. Yep. And so don't be too scared of this. We just don't want you to ask things that aren't necessarily reasonable, right? So you definitely have the right to have enough notes. At this point, you don't know if the doctor's saying you should be out because of that slip disc, right? I mean we could all assume that it probably hurts really bad. But we don't have that information. So you want to get that information from the doctor, and you can definitely ask it. But you're not just going to say, well, anything else? Did she break her leg? I mean, you're not going to go through all that process. You're just going to ask the doctor for what's pertinent. So again, here's that seven days that's provided. Kate, what if I ask the doctor about 10 times for that information? What do I do? Then you go back to the employee and say, I, you know, I'm having trouble being able to designate your leave because I'm not getting information from your doctor. And if I don't get this information, I may not be able to designate this as FMLA leave, which is going to make the employee poop his pants and then going to go talk to his doctor. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Um, <clears throat> my doctor's a little bit harder to get in touch with, I think, than your doctor. So we might have to have a talk. Um, and then if the cert certification is deemed complete, the manager must provide that designation notice, right? So we want to look through that notice, that certification form, make sure that we have all the information, that we understand it, that it's complete. Then we have five days to get that information back to the employee for that designation notice. Did we answer your question?
Okay. So that's where I get um, unsure of what my rights are as the employer to request. Um, in fact, I had an employee hang up on me yesterday. And so that's where I'm in this quandary of what can I do. Right. Well, this is, this is what I would say. I, I would, in writing, say, we gave you the medical certification form on April 1st. It was to be returned to us by April 16th um, and we don't have it. This puts us in a bind. We're not able to give you protected leave unless we get the form and you have until seven days to the 23rd of April to correct this. If you don't correct this by then, you will not be deemed to be on FMLA leave, which means your leave will be unprotected. So then essentially, because I have no medical certification, I could term them for not complying because it's unexcused? Yes, but talk to somebody first before you do that. Okay. Just make sure that um, I hate trees and I love paper, okay, by the nature of my profession. I'm going to want to see a lot of paper before I say, go ahead, can them. Okay. Okay. And so I'm, I'm going to want to know how much paper you've got before I sign off and say that that's okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And what's the backstory, right? Do we find out that there was all of a sudden a serious health condition now we're not accommodating? Or it's that whole, what, what don't we know? Or is this a problem employee and they're just trying to get away for a little while, right? right. So I'm reading what you're saying, um, and I, I understand what that means. And so I'm going to want to make sure. Or my trail will be to my best. Yeah. Exactly. And I think we'll talk about this at some point too, but just because someone's on work comp or they are an FMLA or they have an ADA covered thing doesn't mean we can't discipline for performance. Don't be scared to discipline for performance. Just don't tie it. Because of your condition, we notice that your performance has been decreasing. We never want to say that. We want to refer back to our policies, back to the job description, back to those things that are, you know, behavioral type things like we talked about before. <clears throat> so designation notice. Again, use this form, right? We have five days to complete it. This is where we see a lot of people trail off, right? We've gone through, we've done the certification, we've done the initial notice. If, yep, it's approved, we just didn't give them the designation notice. Make sure that you do that. Recertification. So recertification. No more than every 30 days in, con in connection with an absence unless the condition will last for more than 30 days. Okay, that makes my eyes spin because I don't know what that means. Okay, so let's say you have an employee who needs to be out on leave. You have an undetermined time, okay, say they've got cancer and they had to have like 30 moles removed, okay, just picking a random cancer, probably one that I'll suffer from. Um, but, so they know, first they're going to say they're going to need to be out for three weeks. Then they're not back in that three weeks. And so you now can ask for an additional certification after the first 30 days for them to continue to be out on leave, okay? Then you can ask for another certification at the 60-day mark, okay? But if the doctor says they need to be out for 12 weeks for this particular condition, you may not ask for certification within those 12 weeks, okay? So this is the... You can ask for recertification every 30 days when it's the kind of leave where you, it was intended to be a short-term kind of thing. Does that make sense? Okay. You must wait until the specified period has elapsed already, and that's going to be at least that first 30 days. The next is in, in all cases, you, have to, you may request every six months in connection with an employee, and this is includes when an employee is gone for 26 weeks on the service member leave. You can ask every six months in that particular case. And you can ask for every six months when we have the dreaded intermittent leave, okay? Dun, dun, dun. Mm -hmm. We're gonna get there. Yep. Um, and you may request for less than 30 days only if the employee asks for an extension for the leave, that they have a new condition or they need a more extension, okay? Any questions on that? Clear, clear as mine? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what if an employee, you know, this is typical, uh, a man, I find out a manager says, oh, so-and-so's been out for, you know, three days or whatever, and they, they, is it automatically go to FMLA after a certain amount of time? If, or do they have to ask for 
have done that. I guess that, what is our responsibility as an employer if they don't use those words? They don't have to use the words. Okay. Right? So going back to what's a serious health care condition, what's the reason for being out for more than three days? Right? Maybe the manager knows, maybe they don't know. A lot of times as HR, we might call the employee and say, hey, we noticed you've been out. Tell us what's going on, whatever that looks like. Obviously, you want to have good relationships with your employees, so when you call them, you don't scare them. HR is calling you, oh my gosh. Um, but exactly, they don't have to use those exact words. So I look at FMLA in general as 12 weeks plus three days. Because if they're gone for three days... Then you start going down the do you need do you need FMLA? That's kind of the first trigger. That's yeah. kind of the yeah. first trigger. Okay, I had a massive sinus infection this year that lasted nine weeks. Okay, I was gone for three days because I could not lift my head for three days. Should I have been on FMLA leave? No, but did I need, should should my employer consider? Oh there's something wrong here, we haven't seen Kate in a while, we should maybe figure out and reach out to her? Yes. And so that's, I think of it as 12 weeks plus three days because I have that three-day buffer period. And usually we like our coworkers enough where a coworker is going to come and say, there's something wrong with Kate. Okay? So that can be the other part that may be that trigger. You, God bless you for having that policy. Do you enforce it for everybody? Probably not, is what I'm going to say. Okay. <laughs> no mean to put you on the spot. Cover your name. <laughs> right, of what you know. But the, when you have someone who's, gonna be, who's out for three days and is out to go on that fourth, the manager is probably going to come to you and say, Kate's been gone for a bunch of days. What do I do now? And then that starts that conversation. I'm not going to require you to have the doctor's note for the more than three days because seven other managers within the company haven't been requiring that. So if I start with you, it looks like I'm targeting you. But um, I can, it should start that conversation of, Kate, where the heck have you been? Are you okay? Yep. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't have a line for this because I don't like the policy either. Because if I'm sick, I'm sick. And sometimes I'm a big girl. I know when I'm sick. I don't need Ramsey to tell me I'm sick. Um, but what I would say is if you have some sort of trust issue with the employee, if there has been absentee problems in the past or tardy problems in the past, then it makes sense to ask for it, okay? And you don't need a policy that's, that says you can ask for it. You can say, where have you been? You know, I'm, I'm concerned. Can you get a doctor's note? Did you see a doctor? That kind of question. Well, especially if you have PTO. I was sick, I lost my voice, I was out, it was on PTO, right? I mean, so you have that opportunity. And so it's, what are you really asking the employees for? Is it, what is it fostering that relationship? And are we just doing it because we have this policy so we think we should follow it? Is it actually really helping us as an employer? Is that helpful? Okay, yep. All right, one last. Go, go. Okay, so let's say you have an employee who's been out for more days and you just find out from your manager that they've been out, so you go through the process of getting this person out. Can you speak to that week as FMLA? And we have yeah. a Kate, we'll show you, we'll give you an example of that too. Yeah. Let's finish up these two slides and then we're going to let everybody take a quick break. Does that sound good? Before we get into intermittent leave. So returning the employee back to work. Upon returning back to work, we must put that person back in the equivalent job with virtually the identical pay benefits and other terms of, con uh, and terms of conditions. So that means that same shift in location. We are coming back to work, so now we're going to put you on the night shift. Does that look retaliatory if we have a day shift opening? A little bit, right? So we want to make sure that we're bringing them back to as equivalent to job as virtually if they had still been employed with us. And they cannot be counted against the employee for no fault attendance policy. So if someone's under FMLA and you guys have an attendance policy, you cannot count that against them, right? FMLA is protecting them from that. 
and they aren't protected from actions that otherwise would have affected them if they're not on leave. So what that means, if you guys do a layoff every year and you have someone who's on FMLA, as long as you, and I'm using caution before Kate the raises her hand, <laughs> as long as you can show that if the employee was still on board that they would have been affected by the layoff. And you can really prove that through documentation, not just this time we're picking the uh, layoff by seniority, but if you really have the substantial policies and you can prove that the employee would have been laid off during that time, then that employee is not, you don't have to bring them back. I'd recommend some sort of severance to get rid of the claim, yes. but um, that's what, you can absolutely let them go. Yep. So just be cognizant of that. And then we're going to finish up with fitness to duty and then we'll take a quick break and go back into intermittent leave. Okay, so how many of you have a fitness for duty policy that whenever someone is out that you have a fitness for duty examination before returning them to work? Okay, those of you who have a policy are the only people who can ask for to do this. I shit you not. Okay? You cannot on a random basis go, you know, you've been gone for a while and say, oh, you should have a fitness for duty test before we return you to work. Okay? You need, the employee gets to return to work without a fitness for duty test unless you regularly have a fitness for duty practice and policy in place. Okay? Kate, does that mean that only if we do that for our policy when we come back from FMLA or does that mean like pre-hire fitness for duty? It can be pre-hire fitness for duty as well. Okay? Okay? Yes. It's just for the exam. Okay. You can have the, the note that says, yeah, everything looks good. We just want a note from your doctor that says everything should be fine and that you can do the essential functions of your position. Mm -hmm. Yes. But you're not, you can't send them to the fitness for duty examination first for returning them. Okay. All right. So we just want to clarify one thing on the fitness for duty. So if you have a policy, you can require them to get an exam to say you're coming back. Otherwise, you can ask for a doctor's note to say, hey, you're restored to full, full ability to do your job. Does that make sense? Okay. Intermittent leave. All right, Kate. It's your fave. Intermittent leave is the hardest part of the FMLA. Bar none. Because it seems to be wishy-washy. Right? It seems to be, whenever I feel like I need to take leave, I'm going to take leave today. Oh, my God. It's 65 and sunny. Oh, I so need leave today. I do, technically, but I'm just saying. Um, so, but the FMLA makes intermittent leave a serious benefit that employees have and that they can take. And it has the same serious health condition that we see in regular traditional FMLA where we take all the leave at the same time. Um, and you can calculate leave on an hourly basis for this. So if I need to take two hours off in the middle of my day to go see my doctor, I can use FMLA for that, okay? If we have required overtime that employees are required to do, but someone is going to say, I don't need to do that, the required overtime can be counted as FMLA. Voluntary overtime cannot be. Yes. Okay. Required overtime can be counted as FMLA. So intermittent leave is particularly tricky for most employers and particularly tricky for most managers because it seems to be kind of a fly-by-night kind of thing. If managers are truly butts-in-seats kind of managers, we need face time, we need to see employees, this gets particularly difficult. If you are a service provider like a school and you need people in the classroom teaching, then you need them in the classroom teaching. You can require that employees work with you to work with your schedule to provide leave the best way they can. So if, if uh, say, a teacher has duty hours between 8 and 4, but only has classroom hours between 8 and 2.30, you can say that we want you to take the time off between 2.30 and 4 instead, because that suits our needs best, okay? Kate, or flip up their schedule some way. Kate, what if someone needs to see doctor an appointment for continuing care? Can I have them do it over my lunch break, their lunch break? I can ask them to do it over their lunch break, absolutely. Okay. Any questions on that? You can ask, but you can't require. Because it's going to be kind of up to the doctor as well, right? You can't require. You can ask firmly, um, but you can't necessarily require it. 